You know, and we all have our 15 minutes of fame, and I'd like to take a couple of my 15 minutes to talk about the rights and the wrongs in the world of professional wrestling. And it is for the WWE Championship. This match is for the ECW World Heavyweight Championship. Championship. TNA one night only knockouts, knockdown 2015 review. Third time around for both this review and the pay per view coming from uh, Impact Wrestling. As stated, it is part of their one night only series of pay per views, which uh, has been in traditional format tape it months in advance and we air it sometime later. In this particular case, the pay-per-view was taped February 15th, earlier this year, 2015, and it began airing reportedly on July 1st, roughly three and a half months later, we get the uh, pay-per-view for viewing purposes, which has always been somewhat of a criticism right off the bat. I mean, I don't want to start right into poking that TNA. And, and, and matter of fact, before I do that, I want to make this clear. I think I've said it on several other reviews. I actually do enjoy TNA as an in-ring product. I enjoy uh, Impact Wrestling as an in-ring product. I enjoy some of the people and the personalities on there. Barring all of the issues that have been reportedly there over the past couple of months, Late pay, people leaving because of creative differences, uh, losing TV deals and, and the like. There are several issues and several things that are hanging over their, their collective heads. Uh, the, the, uh, these dark, luminous clouds hanging over the, the company. But if we go past that and we just concentrate on the in-ring work, I'm actually pretty you know, happy with that. I, I hope they can somehow turn it around and get back to a point where they can do these pay-per-views in a timely fashion. And not just the pay-per-views, but their TV show in general. Because it's not just the pay-per-views anymore. They actually tape the, the shows like months in advance, which is which is crazy. But, you, you know, you got to do what you have to do in order to survive. Now, now that I've got that out of my, my system, uh, back to the uh, review uh the the taping of this stuff months in advance does have an impact on on how this is viewed that being that when they try their best to uh to tape this they they tape it with the ongoing storylines more or less in place so when you're watching it a lot of that stuff is already passed is is already done it's already been res- resolved on TV is really no real reason to go back and and rehash it not even in in this format and it being a pay-per-view you you expect pay-per-views to be pretty topical and it's and it's just not it's it's impossible for them to be topical so you have to take it as what it is and just you know kind of roll with the idea that this is out of sequence You're, you're watching something that was done months ago it's already been resolved months ago and just Take it for what it is. The entire card uh, this year was hosted by the Bromance, which goes back to what I just said. The Bromance have now been split. But in this card, they were they were hosted by Robbie E., Jesse Goddard, and DJ Z, who opened it up introducing the non-knockout participants to the arena. And for those that are watching this or planning on watching it, the nine knockouts are all girls that most of us, people that are especially tuning in to this channel or this stream, this podcast, would know because you are familiar with the girls on the indie circuit. Uh, a lot of those girls being uh, Mia Yim, who came back for the third time at the uh, knockouts, knockdown pay-per-view. Alicia, as she was announced. Sue Young showed up. Thea Trinidad, who had wrestled in TNA previously as Rosita, Solo Darling, 
Laura Dennis, who most people know as Cherry Bomb, one half of the the uh, Shine Tag Team Champions, the Kimber Bombs, and former WSU champion, and the returning Mary Kate, who now currently wrestles as Andrea, who was formerly known as Rosie Lotta Love. And by the way, you can uh, get a full interview with Andrea right here with the WPN. Just look that up either on our website, WPNWrestling.com, or on the Women's Pro Wrestling Network YouTube channel. Now, um, I, I want to start with some of the, 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 the cons of this. And again, not poking holes at TNA or Impact Wrestling or how they do things. I know they're doing what they have to do, but I've always felt like the, the, the queen of the knockouts title, which is what they're going for here. The, the entire pay-per-view is built around winning the queen of the knockouts. The underlying theme of the knockouts pay-per-view is the established knockouts are looking to win the, the title, which is, which is basically a tiara. And the uh, unestablished, if you will, the the aspiring knockouts that are coming in are looking to win it and and win the opportunity potentially to work with uh, TNA slash Impact Wrestling. The problem that I have with that is that it's never mentioned. It's never mentioned. It never comes up either on TV. It's not brought up ahead of time. It's not a, brought up after the pay-per-view. That winning the TR doesn't get you a championship shot. They never even say that if the aspiring knockout wins the TR, she wins a contract or she wins money or uh, a, a job offer or a photo shoot, anything. They, they don't give any variation of that. So – just by virtue of that, it feels unimportant. It, it's felt unimportant from the first pay-per-view. It feels unimportant now. It just It's just a tiara to have. It, it, there's, there's no backing up to that. Um, and, again, I know that it's hard to do that when you're shooting these things out of sequence, but I, I would at least like something put behind it, you know, maybe a title shot that night or something like that. But that's hard to do also because – you, you can't get title shots against somebody when they don't know who the reigning champion is going to be. The championship belt never even comes into play at uh, at any point in the, in the night. Nobody walks out with it. I don't think they – they only mention it somewhat in past tense, like so-and-so held it before or something like that. So that that's always a, a, a big issue with me as far as that. Probably not a big deal for a lot of people, but it is an issue with me. The other thing is that the show sometimes feels a little underproduced, especially on the first one. I had a big problem with it on the first one. They, 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 and they did it a, a couple of occasions here where you're watching the pay-per-view and it would just go into a package without any introduction. And not only are you watching this package, package but you're essentially watching an entire match. is is. It's as if they didn't have enough matchups to fill out the entire three hours. So they just decide, all right, well, let's put a match that happened four months ago in here so we can fill the time. Opposed to just cutting it into in uh, a high-tempo edited package that tells the story without taking up too much time and, and serving as filler. The, uh, the other thing is the introduction of the uh, aspiring knockouts. Not that the um, the bromance did a bad job introducing them, which is basically their their job while they were out there. Same thing as uh, EC3 and Rockstar Spud did the previous year. They were out there essentially just to introduce the audience to the girls that they may be a little unfamiliar with. But it takes so long, you know that that, that entire segment takes a a fair chunk of time, and the crowd. The crowd doesn't really help that. That throughout this entire pay per view, that crowd is dead. And recently, it just occurred to me. For those of us out there that watch NXT, and we have looked at the uh, women's division there, it is night and day between how the the pro not the product, but how the matches are received. At NXT, you have a lot of uh, 
just genuine wrestling fans that show up at these events and they they're cheering their heads off. I mean, so much to the point now that you could easily see a Charlotte, a Sasha Banks, a Becky Lynch, or you know Bailey and others. If not do semi, you know, if not do the main event, they can certainly do semi main event because they 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 get a genuine love and reaction from that crowd, and they're not looked at as you know filler or fluff material or anything like that. They're looked at as as genuine wrestlers, and 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 that crowd does help the 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 vibe there. It makes watching it a so much more enjoyable product. The Knockouts Knockdown pay-per-view, again, like every other pay-per-view, or like most of them, have taken place at the Orlando Sound Studio, which I can't even say is the original Impact Zone. It's actually a smaller one. And the the original Impact Zone was a small studio to begin with, so I can it's, it, this place has got to be tiny. But you, you can look out in that audience almost at any given point in that night and, and tell that they – you have a speckle of wrestling fans that are in there. A lot of people are just sitting down, just just watching the shows. Like we're just in here for the air conditioner or something like that. And it robs these girls of, of the matches. The matches themselves were pretty good. I mean, uh, the breakdown of the matches: Mia Yim versus Brooke Tessmacher, or Brooke now nah, she's just called Alicia versus Madison Rain, Sue Young versus Taryn Terrell, Thea Trinidad versus Angelina Love. Solo Darling versus Havoc, Laura Dennis, formerly Cherry Bomb versus Gail Kim, Mary Kate versus Awesome Kong. Those matches were good matches. They they all you know did a, a reasonable job. Some much better than others. I enjoyed Madison Rain as a heel. She was fantastic, and uh, I, I enjoyed the Mary Kate Awesome Kong uh, matchup. But that crowd almost just drained the life out of it. And and it, it made it harder to watch. It would have been a, a much easier thing to digest when you uh, when the crowd was into it too. And if you get the opportunity to watch it, I would say just look at the people in the background. They, and, and Impact Wrestling has gotten to the point where they're kind of forcing to piping in crowd cheers to fill it out. You can almost, you can tell that it's just it's quiet there. Uh, but anyway. And that and that's not a knock on the girls. That is not a knock on the girls or their matches or their personas or anything like that. I I think that most of them are fantastic, but that but again, you know, the crowd just kind of drains it, and kills it. In any event, um, the matches. As most years, I think the the highest number of non knockouts to win thus far is year two. Three of them went in last year. This year, we've only only got one, quote, aspiring knockout that survived the cut, that being Thea Trinidad and a, a match against Angelina Love, and that was won by Countout. Uh, it, it really didn't paint most of them in, in, in great lights, although I will say in, in losing efforts with some of them, they did – Managed to show what they have. Uh, Mia Yim, as I said before, this is her third time around. Uh, always does a good job. Alicia and Madison Rain. Uh, Madison Rain is in this match alone. If you're looking to learn how to, you know, to, for some of the people that need to get heel tendencies, she did a phenomenal job playing up the heel. She was a coward. She was complaining. She ran around. She she made Alicia look like a million bucks and despite the fact that she is a multiple time knockouts champion she walked in with the experience she walked in as the favorite she walked in as the returning uh queen she she won the tournament last year despite all of those accolades she made Alicia look like she was going to take her at any moment and that the only way that she was going to win that match against this unknown quote unquote was to cheat and I thought that was just a, a phenomenal thing that that Madison Rain did. It was, she alone was worth <laughs> watching the pay per view. Um, Sue Young versus Taryn Terrell. Uh, a lot of people may not have been, uh, especially in that audience, may not have been familiar with Sue Young, but she did a, a good job just presenting herself. Sue came out there as this over the top. 
super fan of all the knockouts and impact wrestling and, and everything impact as, as a whole and played it into, I love Taryn Terrell. You're great. And every time they had to lock up and if she lost, she showed her respect, walked over and shook her hand until she got frustrated. And the look that she gave on her face, she just went immediate heel, just, just, it changed at the drop of a dime. And even though Taryn Terrell is the the knockout in this situation, the experience actually would seemingly fall onto Sue's shoulders. And Sue, in the reverse of what we had with Mazarin and Alicia, helped make Taryn look a little bit stronger, look look like a million bucks. You know, she 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 uh gave her she put the heat on her for a good portion of that match, but she but she got the win. So that was uh, it was a, it was a good watch. Solo Dawn and the Havoc match was a little bit different. Havoc was been being portrayed over the last couple of months with that company as the monster heel. Come in, I beat you up. Nobody's bigger than me. I choke slam you. I win. I walk away. That's basically what Havoc was doing with all the matches, and of course. Take it, keep in mind that at this point of the of the tapings, Havoc was in the middle of a feud with Awesome Kong, who had just returned recently at that time. The match with Solo Dawn and Havoc was pretty short. Solo didn't do a great deal, but it probably wasn't a great deal that she could do with with Havoc. She she had she took the beating. That's basically what it came down to. Havoc took Havoc dished out the beating. Solo took the beating. Havoc advanced. Laura Dennis and, and Gail Kim, good match. It was, a, it, it was probably one of the more evenly paced of matches that you were going to get from that entire evening. Uh, Gail Kim, her, she speaks for herself. And the fact that she uh, you know, was able to go in there and, and put out a, another great match, which is what she's known for, is is not surprising. Uh, Laura Dennis put, putting on a good match for those that follow the, the independent circuit again, not surprising. So I expected good things out of them, and they delivered. They, they gave that. Laura went into this thing as the clear heel, Gail Kim as the favorite, and they, they put on a show. Uh, if there was any match that I felt like the the crowd kind of robbed them of what they should have gotten in reaction is this match. They they should have been a little bit higher, hotter for this. Uh, I I wish this had taken place in front of a paying wrestling crowd. It would have been a it would have been an entirely different vibe between those two if it had been a paying wrestling crowd or at least wrestling fans that were waiting to see it. Uh, Mary Kate Awesome Kong. A match I was actually very interested in because uh, Mary Kate Andrea, as some of us know, her, it, on the independent circuit is portrayed as a monster, but she portrayed herself as a monster who was actually a step underneath uh, Awesome Kong. Uh, if you're familiar with the Big John Stud, Andre the Giant kind of dynamic, this is kind of what that was. Stud against most other people back in the day on the WWF was a monster, and he could throw most people around and beat them up, but it was that one guy that, you know, he, he just couldn't do that to. It was Andre the Giant. He could put him in jeopardy, but he had to work to get any wins that he was going to try to get over him, and this is what happened here. Andrea had to work to try to establish some kind of dominance over Austin Kong, which she was having clear issues you know, accomplishing. She just couldn't do it. Awesome Kong was just too big, too strong, too powerful. Had a, a good wrestling skill set, as did Andrea. And Andrea gave it everything she had, but just couldn't do it. Just, just fell up a little bit short. And despite the fact that she stood eye to eye with Kong, like uh, very few people could or can in the uh, knockouts division or women's division in general, uh, despite that, she she displayed the the idea that Kong was the bigger, stronger monster, and I thought it was a good story. Awesome Kong advanced. So now you have the uh, the knockouts who advanced in there. The only aspiring knockout to go over was Thea, who was a former knockout in and of herself. Of course, you know I forgot to mention that uh, Mary Kate. 
did get the chance to tell her her story in a small promo backstage without actually mentioning that she was Rosie Lot of Love. She more or less told you that she had been there before and she was back again. She had lost the weight. She had trimmed up. She's got a whole new attitude and she's willing to show everybody what she can do. I thought that was nice. But uh, so now you have the 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 knockouts who who made it into the the Gauntlet Battle Royal, which is their equivalent of a Royal Rumble. Uh, not nearly twenty people, not not even ten. I think it was uh, about six in in total that went into this thing. Uh, the Gauntlet Battle Royal with with TNA is portrayed a little bit differently, in that at the end of the Battle Royal. It is a one-on-one -on -one match. Once all other competitors have been eliminated and is down to the last two, it turns into a standard matchup. So entering into the match, we had Thea Trinidad, Gail Kim, Madison Rain, Havoc, Taryn Terrell, Brooke, and Awesome Kong. Uh, two of these individuals had won the tournament before, that being Gail Kim and Madison Rain, looking to become the first two-timers. Uh, of this tournament. Trinidad uh, trying to uh, show the world that she uh, deserves to be back as a knockout and that she has a, a new uh, portrayal of her, her life and her style and all that good stuff. The Gauntlet Battle Royal was interesting. They, they uh, did did their jobs and that they, they came out about a minute apart Showed the endurance, showed the beatings that they were taking and all that good stuff. But ultimately, the story there was Kong and Havoc, which was established earlier during the Havoc match. At the end of the match, they played Kong's music, and, and Havoc then swore that we're going to fight by the end of the night. That, that was what it came down to between those, those two. So you knew that the confrontation was coming. So you had another monster versus monster matchup that you were expecting to take place. And after the field was cleared out with uh, – Trinidad, Gail Kim, Madison Rain, Taryn Terrell, and Brooke all being kind of uh, chucked over the top. And, and that is one thing I give credit for in, in these gauntlet battle royals with the knockouts is that they don't do the, oh, as long as you get pushed out of the ring, you eliminate. No, they have to go over the top. It's standard battle royal rules. It makes them come off a little bit tougher. It makes them come off a lot tougher, actually. So they have to go get get put out over the top. They all did, and, they, and the field clears out now nice. Havoc versus Awesome Kong, another monster versus monster match, uh, which had been solved on Impact Wrestling at you know, in a, in a steel cage between these two some time ago. So Awesome Kong meets Havoc again, and it comes down. Awesome Kong wins. Awesome Kong takes her out and secures the Queen of the Knockouts title, which is the Tiara. The match itself, I was it was it was okay. <laughs> I, I wish I could say that it was a little bit more than that. Havoc just comes off better when she has somebody smaller to beat up on. I, I don't I don't think that she can deliver when up against somebody her size. In fact, I, the best matches I've seen Havoc ever have was under the guise of Jessica Havoc back in WSU when she took on uh, Mercedes Martinez. I think that was the single best run that she's had anywhere to date until I'm proven wrong. So, and, and a, a few a few shots that she had against her former partner, Allison Kay. But other than that, I really haven't seen a, any great matches out of it. They've been, they've been all right. Uh, we all know Awesome Kong can do good, so I, I won't even go into that. She, when she's up against the right opponent, she can really deliver the goods. And I thought that if anything, this might have been better if it came down to, say, uh, Awesome Kong versus Gail Kim, which they've had no shortage of good matches in the past, and I, I have no doubt that they could have uh, done magic together again. Or even if it came down to Awesome Kong and Trinidad, where you know Trinidad could have lost the match, but 
having hung in there as the aspiring knockout, trying to fight for her spot, getting past Angelina Love earlier in the night, surviving all of the knockouts in the gauntlet, making it down to the finals where she's going up against this big monster who was clearly towering over her. And if she had this awesome uh, match but still lost, I thought it, it could have been a great story in that much, but they didn't do that. I guess, I guess they felt differently. It was no real point in trying to do it since they don't really acknowledge this stuff on TV. It, and it doesn't go anywhere beyond the pay-per-view. So that was that. Awesome Kong did not bother with the crown. In fact, when it was presented to her by the referee, she choke slammed the referee for even bringing it in the ring. So the crown meant nothing to the viewing audience, and it meant nothing to Awesome Kong. The only other match that took place this night was a intergender six uh, six person tag team elimination match. This took place because the reason that Trinidad won earlier is because uh, a distraction by Crazy Steve of the Menagerie. That has caused a count out. Trinidad won, and Angelina Love and the Bromans took exception to that, which caused them to jump Crazy Steve, which then brought out Nux and Rebel. The challenge was made, and the match was accepted, and they went on to have the, the elimination match earlier, I mean, well, excuse me, later in the night. Uh, who was the first? I think uh, Crazy Steve might have been the first person that was actually eliminated off of this thing. And The intergender match was just, it was just basically filler. It, 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 it was another way to try to rope around a feud that was going on at the time, which doesn't mean anything now. Uh, it, that, that feud has come and gone, but they, they played it out again on the, the course of the pay-per-view. It, it, was, it was a fun watch. It was nice to see Rebel get in a, a few hits against the far more experienced Angelina Love. But ultimately, you know, she she got rolled up and put out by Robbie E. The the match in it as Nux defeated the uh, remaining bromans, Robbie E. and Jess, Jesse Goddard, and, and won the match. And that was pretty much where that started and stopped. It was, it was just a, 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 another way to work in uh, some of the guys onto an all-female pay-per-view, which is, which is more or less what they did the, the previous year. They found a way to work in one of the guys into the show so they can have a match on the pay-per-view so it's not totally all women. The uh, pay-per-view in and of itself, for the 15 bucks that I paid for it, it was it was a fun watch. It was nice. Uh, don't go into it expecting the world. Ignore the crowd because they're not going to give you anything. They, you know, and I know crowd response isn't necessarily the end all be all for pay per views, but but sometimes it helps. It really does. It helps to see that some people are enjoying themselves and they they want to be there. That that energy and that vibe does transfer to TV sometimes, and it makes you enjoy it a little bit more. But they just didn't give you that. They, they just didn't have it. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's a three-hour show for 15 bucks, less than $20. Nothing to lose out of that. In fact, I mean, most of their one-night-only is a do deliver in terms of that much. I just wish that it had more out of it. And I wish that the crown the, of the queen of the knockouts had more implications behind it. It would make me care more about this pay-per-view if the, the goal in hand was something worth obtaining. And that's it. So if you got a chance, go ahead and check it out. Just know that everything there is old. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's storylines that don't mean anything today. So if you can get past that, it's worth it. Or you can wait for the DVD, provided that Impact Wrestling actually makes the DVD somewhere in the future. All right, guys, that's it. I want to thank you for sitting through this review and critique of the Knockouts Knockdown 2015 pay-per-view. Be sure to browse around our website and channel on YouTube, WPNWrestling.com. Browse around there for other podcasts and matches and blogs and 
profiles and things like that. We're trying to update those things all the time. And uh, if you want matches, make sure you go through the YouTube channel. There's plenty of them there. Thanks a lot for tuning in, guys.